Greetings and salutations from the University of California, Davis, in hot and sunny Sacramento, California. I'm Elizabeth Raskin, and I'm excited for the opportunity to present on the topic of intraoperative and postoperative anastomotic leak. No great consensus exists on the definition of an anastomotic leak, but it's commonly described as a defect in the intestinal wall integrity at the anastomotic site that leads to a communication between the intraluminal and extraluminal compartments. And we can subcategorize a leak into early versus late presenting leaks, those that are symptomatic versus asymptomatic, as well as intraoperative and postoperative leaks. The vast majority of leaks occur within the first postoperative week, and these are commonly referred to as early leaks. Late leaks present three to four weeks after surgery. Nationally, there's a wide range of gastrointestinal leak rates, but specifically for colorectal and coloanal anastomoses, these range from 5 to 10 and 10 to 17 percent respectively. Given the devastating nature of anastomotic leaks, mortality rates can reach upwards towards 20 percent. Historically, this rate has not changed in over 25 years. Leaks are associated with numerous short-term and long-term complications. Prolonged antibiotic use and associated diarrhea is common. In contained leaks, IR place strains are ubiquitous, but not without associated risks. Returns to the OR may be warranted with large and uncontained leaks. Postoperative short-term complications, such as the development of enterocutaneous fistula, prolonged intubation, ICU admission, and increased length of stay are common. Long-term sequelae include increased morbidity and mortality, decreases in overall survival, decrease in cancer-free survival, the risk of a permanent stoma, and the exponential increase in cost of care. Focusing on the intraoperative leak, several technical factors can be contributors. Stapling misfires, poor suturing, and tension on the staple or suture line have been reported. No significant differences are noted in the literature regarding leak rates and modality of anastomotic creation, whether staples or sutures are used. The lack of mobilization and lack of redundancy can cause tension, and this is especially notable in the reoperative field and in conditions where a foreshortened mesentery can be seen, such as obesity and Crohn's disease. Edema from obstruction, resuscitation, or poor nutrition can challenge anastomotic integrity. Thin or fibrotic tissues present a similar challenge for holding sutures or staples. Typically, the intraoperative leak is either noted incidentally or when challenging the anastomosis under pressure, Otherwise, the intraoperative leak is just a postoperative leak that was caught early. Interestingly, surgeons are bad at predicting an astomotic leak by using such traditional methods as assessing a palpable pulse or the color of the bowel edges. A notable paper by Karlicek from 2009 presents a study of 191 patients who underwent a colorectal anastomosis. Surgeons were asked immediately post-op to predict the risk of a clinically relevant leak by using a visual analog scale from 0 to 100%. 13.6% of the patients had leaks, but surgeons only accurately predicted these leaks 7.1% of the time. The accuracy of assessment did not correlate with clinical experience. What this tells us is that our traditional methods are not good enough to identify the riskiest anastomoses, and more qualitative data is warranted. Most surgeons use the generic anastomotic leak test after colorectal anastomosis, where the bowel is submerged under saline while the proximal bowel is occluded. Insufflation through the distal bowel with either a proctoscope or sigmoidoscope attempts to elicit bubbling from the anastomosis, essentially signaling a leak. And this gives the surgeon the opportunity to evaluate, alter the anastomosis, or divert. Alay and colleagues presented a paper at SAGES two years ago, which showed that patients who had leak tests versus those that did not had better outcomes. The use of ICG and angiofluorescence has been postulated to help with more qualitative evaluation of an anastomosis by fluorescing bowel that is well perfused versus that which is not. And this can allow the surgeon the same opportunity to take corrective action or have reassurance about the connection. The Pillar 2 trial looked at left-sided colorectal anastomoses using pinpoint and angiofluorescent technology in 147 patients. They appropriately fluoresced the tissues in 99% of patients, causing them to revise the anastomosis on 11 patients. There were two leaks in this study, but interestingly, Neither was one of the revised anastomosis. Typically, 7.5 milligrams of ICG is injected intravenously. Uptake is seen within 30 seconds of the injection. A well-defined demarcation is noted, signaling adequate perfusion distally. Now, what about the postoperative leak, specifically the asymptomatic postop leak? 
The eponymous Gallagher leak was born from the 1970s study that John Gallagher and colleagues published, which tested fresh colorectal anastomoses with barium enemas on post-op days five through seven. 69% of these patients had radiographic leaks, but were not necessarily symptomatic. So the question isn't who leaks, but rather who becomes symptomatic. Leaks happen either because of dehiscence or necrosis. The ends pull apart where there is poor tissue integrity, tension, or trauma. Some postulate enzymatic breakdown of the bowel ends from intestinal flora. And this is supported by the notion that preoperative oral antibiotics have been associated with decreased leak rates. Microbiome studies may help elucidate the bacterial balance needed to heal an anastomosis. Vascular supply is clearly critically important and can be compromised from either surgical technique or patient factors. Despite good technique and blood supply, leaks still occur. We can look to the possible impact that the microbiome has on the anastomosis. We know that certain microbes like Pseudomonas and Enterococcus produce a collagen-degrading enzyme called collagenase. The collagenase then triggers the production of matrix metalloproteinases that cause further tissue destruction. This cascade has supported the indication for mechanical bowel prep and oral and IV antibiotics as prophylactic measures against leak and surgical site infection. There are many risk factors for leak, but specifically preoperative risks include male sex, ASA class, prior neoadjuvant chemoradiation, presence of metastatic lymph nodes, anemia, malnutrition, and a smoking history. Intraoperative factors include the urgency of the surgery, operative length, intraoperative transfusion, the level of anastomosis, ischemia, tension, and edema. The symptomatic postoperative leak may be characterized by increased abdominal pain, distension, tachycardia, fever, elevated white count, and a rising procalcitonin level. Key in the postoperative setting is early detection. A critical evaluation of the patient is needed, including a physical exam with vital signs. Imaging and lab work may be warranted. CRP and procalcitonin can be helpful values when used strategically. CRP, unfortunately, is very insensitive and nonspecific, but here's a word on procalcitonin. It's made exclusively by thyroid C cells, and in healthy individuals, the levels are extremely low. But in sepsis, procalcitonin is made by non-thyroid cells, such as white blood cells, spleen, kidney, pancreas, adipocytes, brain, and colon. And it's described as an early, sensitive, and specific marker for sepsis. In sepsis, bacterial endotoxins stimulate the production of procalcitonin, releasing it into the bloodstream in three to four hours and peaking after eight to 24 hours. Values under 0.5 nanograms per milliliter suggest a low risk of sepsis, while values greater than two suggest a high risk of sepsis and shock. Now, depending on a patient's presentation, imaging may be warranted. As demonstrated in this gastrograph and enema study, a contained leak may be diagnosed. Typically, this can be treated with antibiotics and drainage of the collection. The patient may need bowel rest. Alternatively, an uncontained leak, as noted in this CT scan, requires operative management, where a washout, interrogation of the anastomosis, and then possible revision of the anastomosis, diversion, or takedown of the anastomosis may be needed. A summary slide regarding surgical decision-making. Clearly, the surgeon must take into consideration the status of the patient while considering the options. For intraoperative leaks, the intraabdominal anastomosis may not be noted to have a leak unless mucosa or succus is grossly visualized. Uh, alternatively, if colonoscopic evaluation reveals a small dehiscence, we can consider these options of oversewing or revision. If the defect is large, a revision is warranted. A drain can be considered, but not to prevent leak, but to alert postoperatively that there may be a problem. The pelvic leak is more likely to be discovered intraoperatively due to the ubiquitous leak test. If a small leak is noted, let's say less than five millimeters, over sewing or revision should be done. Diversion may also be needed. If the leak is larger, revise the anastomosis with a consideration for diversion. A drain may be considered for the same reason as above. The postoperative leak is a bit different. If an intraabdominal leak is noted, a contained leak can be treated typically with antibiotics in an image-guided drain placement. If there is a free-flowing leak or an uncontained leak, abdominal exploration should be done. A pelvic anastomotic leak depends really on the timing after surgery. The surgeon will need to assess the quality of the tissue and the operative field. The options include, but are not limited to, washout with or without oversewing of the defect with diversion, 
loop diversion alone or takedown of the anastomosis with end diversion. I would highly caution against the revision of an anastomotic leak at that time. In summary, anastomotic leak is a vexing problem that may be multifactorial in nature. Identifying intraoperative leak may allow for prevention of a postoperative leak. The air leak test and the use of angiofluorescence can provide qualitative intraoperative feedback. Astute postoperative care is essential for early detection of leak, and decision making is critical for making the next best steps in management. What is clear is that anastomotic leak is associated with poor patient outcomes, including oncologic recurrence and astronomically high costs of care. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to present in this unique forum.